Hello and welcome to ODI Fridays. I'm Steph and I work for the Open Data Institute. Thank you to everyone who's joined us here at ODI HQ this afternoon and to those of you who are also watching live on Twitter. I'm delighted to welcome Anna Scott back to the ODI. Anna used to be our head of content here and is now a freelance content strategist, trainer and storyteller specialising in data ethics and rights issues. Today, Anna will talk through creative approaches to engaging people to data issues. We will be taking questions for Anna at the end, so if you do have a question, I'll pass around this microphone. It won't actually amplify your voice, but it's just so that people who are watching on Twitter can hear you. And to th those of you who are watching the live stream, please send your questions for Anna using the hashtag ODI Fridays on Twitter. Thank you, and enjoy the talk. Thanks, Steph. Um, Thanks very much. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> How many people actually care about Valentine's Day? None? One. Hey. Um, well, I've taken the liberty of putting some chocolates on your chair just to celebrate. I've also got this feather boa, which I might wear for a bit. Um, I'm actually going to a hen later, so it's two birds, one boa. Um, anyway, wh why are we here? So we're going to be talking about ways in which we can creatively engage broad people in data issues. I think we're all agreed that Data is important, it can affect people's lives, how it's collected, used and shared, but there is an issue around engaging people, so-called normal people. There's a problem in that often people, real people, whoever real people are, aren't considered to, to care much or uh, it's often said that they're quite complacent. I don't know if you remember, um, it was Amber Rudd a few years ago said that real people don't care about perfect security, they just want nice flashy services. Um, I think that's a, a bit of a problem and we have, we've done some research into this. This is a, a survey last year at the ODI that asked people how they felt about data about them being used by the companies and the institutions that they interact with and we found that nearly, well, 87% of people felt it was really important that organisations they interact with use data about them ethically and interestingly only 30%, 31% of people trusted central or local government with data about them. So that kind of paints a picture. Um, we also know this because we spoke to real people uh, during um, a project last year with uh, the RSA and Luminate. I'm going to take this off, it's quite hot. Um, uh, where we, we spoke to people in workshops and asked them how they felt about rights issues and data issues. Um, and while they didn't always understand exactly how, they, how data was being used or shared, they, they did think things needed to change and they were frustrated. So this is what they told us. They wanted greater honesty and transparency, agency and control, compliance and enforceability, rights and responsibility, and context and fairness about how data, over how data about them is, is used. Um, it's my favourite quote from someone in one of the workshops, <laughs> trying to get something back off the internet is like trying to take the piss back out of a swimming pool, um, which is quite funny, but it's also, it says a lot about how people see, normal people see data. Um, so, okay, I, I'm summing up some of the problems with the three M's, <laughs> muggles, mums and machines. Um, I think it's a problem how a lot of techie people, like coders, for example, talk about people who can't code as muggles. Um, I've heard it quite a lot and it's, I think it entrenches the issue. I know it feels nice to be part of a special club, but it kind of makes people feel a bit alienated when they're not in that special club. Uh, mums, people talk a lot about whether or not their mums would understand. Um, like, just leave mums alone. I mean, what about dads? But mums are people and, you know, politicians are people. So I think it kind of, I know, I know it's well-intentioned and the idea is that we should be using more kind of plain English, which we should, but we shouldn't be seeing just mums as the only people that we need to try and explain things really, really carefully to. It's everyone. Um, and machines, the way that machines are presented, um, I think is, is an issue, particularly the kind of uh, mid-90s version of the future that often gets portrayed. So this is a real graphic that was attached to an invitation that my brother got to a real tech conference, um, which shows this kind of dystopian, scary future that I can't recognise at all. Um, but if we're talking about issues that are important today, let's, let's use imagery that references things that we see and do today. Um, my favourite thing about this is the little robot dog that he's, he's taking for a walk. Um, so I'm going to talk through some creative approaches that I think help um, based on work I've done with people but also things that I've seen externally from the ODI. Um, and it starts with, well, there, I'm going to talk through several kind of guiding principles. And the first is to ask open-ended questions and invite the audience to think. So it kind of respects their agency as 
people who have perspectives and have things to learn themselves and uh, decisions to make and so on. So this is the first example I'm going to talk through. This is the data spectrum. Uh, some of you may have seen it before. We created this a long time ago and we've iterated it quite a few times since. And the idea is that as you see it, you have to think through where data should go on a spectrum. So it's not binary, it's not closed or open. It exists on a spectrum and it's something to keep thinking about and keep discussing with people where data should go on the spectrum. Should it be closed? Should it be shared? If so, how? Group-based access, public access, named access, and then open, so for anyone to access, use, and share. Um, and we created this because lots of people, I think, thought that because we're the Open, open Data Institute, we thought that all the data should be open. But no, this is a kind of conversation starter, so that's the first example. This is the data access map. Um, this is the product of lots of conversations and lots of uh, collaboration with lots of different types of people from researchers to artists to the CEO to, to loads of people even outside of the organisation because we wanted to understand how they perceived it. But this is essentially a map that helps people think through different forms, models of accessing and sharing data. And it's obviously it's a, a metaphor, but it uses something that we're quite used to seeing, a map, but these are all fictional islands. So we've got Calabador Coast, um, we've got the Isle of Human. Um, you can't see any of the labels annoyingly because of the, how small they are, but um, I've linked to all of these in the slides which I'll share so you can explore these in greater detail later on. Um, but something to share is that we initially thought that this little man looked a bit too much like David Brent, so <laughs> you can see it's kind of like splayed. So we, uh, we made it more of a, a nice curious human here looking up. Um, so another guiding principle is kind of let your audience interact and make decisions themselves. So an, an example I really like, it comes from uh, YLE, Yule, I don't know how to pronounce it. Please correct me if you do. It's the Finnish public service media company who also make games. This is a game that helps you to understand what happens in troll factories, which, which yeah. exist. <laughs> and you, the user, are uh, given jobs by your boss. Um, and the idea is that you can... You're, you're supposed to influence how people think on social media. Um, so how many people can you reel in? So these, these are some screenshots from the game itself. Um, where well, your boss is this kind of shadowy figure who uses quite a kind of colloquial tone, which kind of makes you tempted to do well and, and be almost friends with them. And it's really uncomfortable, actually, because your task is to, in this case, spread anti-immigration content on, on social media. And you get to choose your target group. So, for example... 18 to 29 year old anxious young people on Instagram, uh, 30 to 45 year olds, parents with young kids on Facebook, etc. Um, so you get to choose between real life memes that have been shared um, to, to change people's perspectives. Um, this is Docsbox Trustbot, which is part of our current exhibition as, uh, at Data's Culture. You must have walked past it actually on your way in, you may have seen it. Um, so this is another example of an interactive piece that allows people to decide things themselves. So as, as the audience, you sit with the docs box, trust bot, and have a conversation. And it, it's kind of a fake AI or kind of puppet ro robot hybrid that makes decisions um, about you, makes assumptions about you based on what you share. And then you get trust credits for, for sharing. Um, but I thought I would let Alistair, who's the artist behind this, Alistair Gentry, explain it in her, his own words. Hopefully it will work. Docsbox is a pretend AI. It interviews you about your digital life and the services you use, and then it can tell you stories about the effects that might have on your life as a whole. It gently encourages you to share more than you might want to. People interact with it as if it's a thing, as if it's a, an entity or a machine even though there's a person sitting next to it working it. It was just really telling me what I already knew but didn't want to know. The colours of it, I think, summed up how like, it, it seductive this all is. I use all of them, Microsoft, Facebook, WhatsApp. I don't have any other option. I just have to keep browsing. The Open Data Institute and the Data as Culture programme have just been great places to work. They were particularly good at helping me to get out of the darker implications of it to make sure that things are free and fair and open and equitable, which are the subjects I'm talking about in this work. We could use the same technologies to really genuinely do good and be nicer to each other. Great. 
Um, so another example is the Data Ethics Canvas, which some of you may have seen. We've iterated it as well. But this essentially asks you, as the audience, to think things through in ways that you might not have before. But it's not prescriptive. It doesn't say what is right or wrong. It asks questions, prompting questions. And the idea is that you experience it either alone at the beginning of a data project or with a team. So it's something that you can use as a prompt to discuss things and maybe think about how you see things differently. So a third guiding principle is to invite your audience to tell their own stories and create something themselves. So examples of this that I like come from uh, the MIT Media Lab, which created what's called the moral machine. And again, it's quite an uncomfortable thing to play because you're the user, you're making decisions about the value of life and who, whose life is more important than someone else's. But you're experiencing it in a way that you wouldn't necessarily understand if you were just to read about it in a report, for example. So this is all about the, uh, the ethics of machine learning, and dri well, driverless cars in this case. Uh, and here's a scenario where you're able to actually design it yourself. Again, really uncomfortable, but you have to actively do those things as the user. This comes from a project that we did with the RSA Illuminate, which I referred to earlier, uh, trying to understand how people see data about us. And as part of it, we invited participants in the workshop to create things themselves. So we, we gave them some scripts to kind of do some role play together about the issues, the surrounding issues. And then we just said, do whatever you want. You can create a poster, you can create a performance. And some of them did. Some of them made some plays. And it was really interesting because these people had no idea what they were getting themselves into. They, the last, someone, one of them said that the last... Um, workshop they'd been to for this particular kind of market research company had had them just trying out custard, like tasting custard. <laughs> so they turned up and we were like, data rights. Um, but they understood, they understood it really well and they, they felt really passionately about it by the time that they were able to do this. So these are just examples of posters they made um, talking about data rights here. So what's yours and what's theirs? So thinking about big tech companies. Um, but it was a really lovely way of engaging them. So a fourth guiding principle is include diverse people and help your audience to relate. Um, something that we, we focused on quite a lot at the ODI was to create personas that represented a, a broad group. So thinking about diversity in terms of ethnic background, age, ability um, and gender. So we were sure to create personas that could represent lots of different types of people. And I think this is a really important thing to to point out is that you might think your particular audience, particularly if you're doing something quite data or tech heavy, isn't that diverse. But I think we, we need to include diverse people in all of the outputs that we create because people need to be able to see themselves as being re relevant, basically. Um, so actually, here are some examples of uh, how we've used them. So that's from an annual report, and this is at the ODI Summit. We used uh, personas in banners as people walked in. Uh, another thing you can do is use <coughs> animals. So often if people see a character, they try to relate with them in terms of their demographics. So they might think, well, if that's a middle-aged man and I'm a young woman, then I, this isn't for me or this, that can't represent me. So we decided to use, as the output from, from the, uh, the project itself and the conversations that we'd heard, we used um, shadow puppets, uh, which also had the benefit of representing data's kind of intangibility and how it's, it's kind of mysterious and shadowy but we use animals so that people could project themselves onto the characters. Um, but we were also quite sure of using um, regional accents so that it wasn't all quite a homogenous group. So here we decided this might be a nice scene for uh, young women together talking in like a Burger King, chatting about their um, feeds, so what, what they see in their feeds as they go, as they shop. Um, <coughs> And this is a kind of cabbie who's a bit disgruntled and he's kind of talking about being followed around on the internet. Um, so I would like to play it. Uh, I thought this would happen, so here you go. Oops. But data's everything. It helps with planning and schools and transport and, and world health and less poverty. Yeah, and I want to know how. But if it's anonymous and shared for society, why do you care? But I do care. I want to know where it's going and have a say in how it's used. Data about us. 
Tell us what it's for. Give us a say. I did a data request today. <laughs> That's GDPR, isn't it? <sighs> oh, those bloody emails. Some company said, we've got this data about you and we're going to hang on to it unless I choose to opt out. Well, that's good, isn't it? Unless I opt in, it's better. Companies should be clear about what data they've got, how it's used, and give us choice over what happens. GDPR is a start, though, right? Yeah, but it needs to get better. Data about us. Strengthen data protection. <clears throat> it feels like they target us. They really, they really hone in on you. Hard. I don't mind general adverts, but now the big companies. Oi! All the data they've got, just too much. Back in the day, you weren't super targeted. But now, we follow around the internet. It feels like someone's on your shoulder all the time. <clears throat> you know? Data about us. Don't target us. Whoa. My food is like too much. I'm very into my trainers at the moment. I get loads of clothes ads in line. It freaks me out. Like, they know what I like and, and like everyone's ads are different because of what they like. Yeah, I'm not a robot. Companies decide, boy, girl, likes, dislikes, like we won't change, ever. I'm not a robot, I'm me. Data about us. We are not robots. Great, so, um, Great, so another guiding principle is to play with form. Um, I referenced the uh, Data's Culture Programme earlier, but there are so many different artists and materials that we've, we've used or that we've, we've commissioned from, from artists that tell stories about data. Um, and I sadly can't talk about all of them today, um, but I thought to come to, to reference some of my favourite. So just as an example, these are, this is the breadth of all of the exhibitions that we've had um, and again, using lots of different types of materials. So this one here, Thinking Out Loud, was in 2016, based on the practice of sound artist um, Alex McLean. So lots of, lots of sounds, lots of exploration around, around how data is captured and how data can be converted into sound. Um, this is our current exhibition, Copy That, which uses poems, the poems of Mr G, um, uh, as well as the performance documentary of Alice Gentry, Doc's Box Transport, which I mentioned earlier and a, a pinball machine, which is just out there that you can interact with. So it's really diverse. And I should say that this was founded by Julie Freeman, who co-directed it with Hannah redler -Hors, um, And is, it's now directed solely by Hannah, direct, uh, Hannah redler -Hors, And Hannah's here in the audience here. Um, if you have any questions or, well, actually you're busy just after this, aren't you? Mm -hmm. But till here till the end of the talk. Um, if you have any uh, questions or would you like, if you'd like to talk about uh, any potential partnerships. Um, so some of my favourite pieces uh, include Ceiling Cat, which some of you may have seen if you've been here before. Um, I really like how this um, interweaves the kind of real and the virtual um, to create complex open-ended narratives. So Ceiling Cat would observe the ODI from above, um, and it's a direct interpretation from the artist of the, the meme with the same name. You may have remembered the Ceiling Cat meme, it kind of did the rounds a few years ago. But... I love how you can experience it as a kind of one-off gag or as a reflection on the power that we entrust to the internet. Um, and it kind of represents the nature of like a fictional omnipresent surveillance culture. Uh, and for me, it, it shows what's kind of cute and sinister about the internet at once, but using something that we don't tend to associate with, with tech, so a, a dead cat in this case. <laughs> um, another is Mini Rugs and Their Friends by Rita Oyten. Oytenen. Um, and I really, really like this example because, again, it's where kind of craft meets technology, reminding us of the limitations and the bias in computational seeing systems in this case. So Rita experimented with Google image recognition software. Um, so she'd knitted these, these rugs and then 
experimented to see uh, whether Google could interpret them correctly. Um, and the results were quite surprising uh, and quite gendered. Um, so there was firstly like a bias towards humans and household objects. They didn't return any other textiles. But anything that was red tended to be female forms, um, blue, male, uh, yellow and peachy colours kind of represented or returned rather exposed flesh, human flesh, um, predominantly female, but browns and blacks did not. Um, three years later, she ran, in, in 2017, she ran the experiment again to see whether Google's uh, algorithms had improved and they hadn't, well, they didn't bring back any pictures of rugs anyway. Um, but what's intriguing about this is that while we're really concerned with kind of facial, facial recognition software, um, something as basic as a rug can completely stupefy um, Google's algorithms. So it kind of invites us to think what other imagery uh, is unable to be recognized by these kind of seemingly intelligent systems. Uh, and this is another example that I like from outside the ODI. So this is a project by Projects by IF and Google AI um, that sought to explain, uh, well, look at explainability in personalized machine learning, particularly in the context of federated machines. Um, so this is a person retracing the steps in a local model's training log, so you can restore it to a previous version. Uh, and this is uh, looking at how we can open up how to manage boundaries of what models can learn um, to third parties uh, acting on behalf of many people. So defining the limits of what local and global models can, can learn. Um, and finally, I thought I could share some tips for illustrations and graphics that I uh, think would be useful for people who are looking to commission similar things. Um, so first, what's the message? So obviously keep it as clear and simple as possible. Um, think through what the journey is that you want to tell. What's the story? So tie it to real life if possible. Um, Think how you want your audience to feel. Emotion is really important. So do you want them to feel curious and ask questions? Do you want them to feel like a light bulb moment? In which case you want to take them through with clear guidance through a kind of complex issue. Um, do you want them to feel optimistic? So what this represents, the strategy behind it is has answers. Um, or do you want them to feel concerned? Maybe that what's the problem that you want to, to highlight? Make it fun. It's helpful if people like to share it and enjoy interacting. Um, look at the information from different perspectives. So think about the different, the diversity of the audience that could come into contact with what it is that you're creating. Um, and then, yeah, bring in diverse creatives. That's a really important point. Um, it might be that you've got designers in-house, but often commissioning something from someone externally can give you a completely new take on the issue, which is really helpful. And having worked with loads of different types of creatives, designers, illustrators, artists, um, poets, it's, it's been really magical to see what, what can come up when you put lots of different people together. So an example is these poems here by Mr G have been interpreted and represented by Adrian Philpott, who's um, the kind of associate creative director here at the ODI. But he's, he's taken these poems and presented them in a way that's really different. And I spoke to Mr. G, the poet, and he, he said, I'm not visual at all. I'd, I'd, I would never have thought of doing this, but it's really nice to see them presented in a way that I never would have done before. So it's lovely to get collaboration uh, as, as this kind of centerpiece of your guiding, guiding your, your creatives. Um, look at, yeah, invest in good design, that's another point. Um, Often there's this kind of misconception that because it's like colourful and fun, it doesn't cost much or that it's easy to do, um, which isn't true, <laughs> obviously. Uh, so invest in good design and just accept that it will cost it some money. Um, and also just be as inclusive as possible. It's good for everyone. Respect your audience and their time. If it's really hard to understand, then it won't be that fun <laughs> uh, or effective. And finally, some tips for commissioning. So this is kind of more granular, but I thought it would be useful for people who want to engage creatives but haven't done it before. Um, so firstly, keep an open mind, like allow room for collaboration. Uh, it can be easy to just have this very, very specific idea of what you want. But remember that creatives themselves, it, I mean, their job is to think slightly differently. Um, so allow, the, allow room for collaboration, allow time for collaboration and an exchange of ideas, an exchange of kind of challenge. Um, be clear on the use from the start, so will it be used on mobiles? This really helps when it comes to things like font sizes and whether or not they need to be um, something you can edit later on. Uh, share material you like, it's really nice to be able to 
see, as a, as a creative, as a designer or an illustrator, see examples of things, even if it's a completely different medium, if it's a, I don't know, it could be a song, it could be, it could be something completely different, but it helps to guide them and give them an idea of what it is, the sentiment that you, you want to share. Um, <coughs> say what aspects of the, it's really obvious, but <laughs> say what aspects of the brands must be followed. So if there are colours or fonts that um, you want to be represented, then think that through and ask them. Because often, if there's flexibility, then that's that's makes it a completely different exercise for a for a creative. Um, tell them about the audience. If you know about the audience, tell them who you think this needs to um, change the minds of or reach. Um, be clear on deadlines and schedule. <laughs> that's obvious, but it can be easy to forget that. And then, yeah, explain. Uh, what you need for each proofing stage, so whether it's rough ideas or worked up graphic. Um, and thanks to Ian the Illustrator for helping me with this list. <laughs> uh, and that's it, basically. I just wanted to show some things, and it's a bit of a whistle stop tour, but um, I knew that I couldn't talk about everything, so I've had to be selective. But I'd love to answer any questions if you have any. Any questions in the room? Hi, Anna. Um, I should know this, having worked alongside you for so long, but I don't. Can you talk to us more about the process of the data ethics canvas and how you, um, what sort of things you've been asking yourself for all the different iterations as well? Uh, yeah, sure. So the data ethics canvas um, was a very collaborative process. We it started with just a list of questions. It was I think Ellen Broad and Peter Wells who kind of did the brunt of the first step, um, but. It was a really interesting process because there was lots to think about in terms of design and how things were set, how things were presented, but also the ideas behind it. So I guess in answer to your question, we wrote things down um, and tried to place them in ways that made sense without thinking too much about the design by that point and then brought designers in. So in this case, it was, it was Kaylee Dewhurst, who's outside, I think, um, who did the first iteration. And then we got Adrian Philpot to come and help uh, and he brought in a very different view, so it was quite useful to have a designer's perspective. That's another quite important aspect of this. Design happens concurrently with research often, so designers will ask questions that really change the way you see something. So it's a really important thing not to think of design as this sort of final glean on what is a, a kind of static idea. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's quite interesting. Do you have any data yourself about how effective this is in engaging beyond the very non-diverse people in this room? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a, a really good question. Um, Hannah, who's our, well, the ODI's uh, head of marketing and membership, has been thinking this through quite a lot, as well as Hannah Redler, who is here, who directs the Data Culture Programme, thinking about how you can capture this kind of stuff because often it is just subjective and it's something that people don't necessarily feed back. Um, but we've tried really hard to get people's perspectives uh, on how things look and how they feel and capture them however we can. So that might be a just you hear a nice thing or you hear something that is critical perhaps and you just kind of email it around to your colleagues. There's no perfect, in my view, there's no perfect way of capturing this kind of data. Um, but yeah, for me, it's all about how people feel and how they interact with it. Thank you for a very engaging presentation. Um, I was doing a talk around um, sort of ad tech and sort of data issues around it, mm -hmm. and um, people were engaged, but um, a lot of comments were, we just don't care about data privacy, what happens with the data, we just want utility back from mm -hmm. tech companies, and we get a lot. So how do you go about engaging people who are sort of not even sitting in the middle who are deniers? Deniers of the importance of data. Or deniers of, of the importance of data who are almost like, well, I, I get it intellectually, but mm. I reject your kind of lefty sort of argument. Um, it's a good question. I mean, I don't know if I'm an authority <laughs> on this as such, but um, based on my experience, uh, the, the kind of guiding principle of getting people to interact with something helps them to see what the implications are and making, putting them personally in the position of making decisions that have 
implications, whether they're dangerous or not, um, helps them, I think, to care more, <laughs> generally. That's my, in my experience. But I'm interested if people have anything else that they want to add to that. I mean, we can have a conversation about it. Might be, okay. Um, are there any like mediums or artists you'd love to do and commission work for that you haven't already? Mediums or artists I'd like to commission work for? Uh, well, I've, I've gone freelance, so <laughs> <laughs> if anyone wants to um, come to me with uh, any work that they want um, in, in, on this kind of uh, subject, that would be great. But I, I don't know, it's in terms of a dream, I, I, this has been my dream. It's been a really, really fortunate position to be in to work with such diverse artists as you know, poems and, sorry, poets and performance artists. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Anyone else? Hey, um, I'm wondering if there are any topics or themes that work best through a more creative medium. Is it like you know, and you sort of showed the example of trolls and online apps. I'm not talking about that. <clears throat> I'm talking about the sort of physical art installations and whether it's like a gender focus or people or climate or whatever that you think works best. Um, I don't know. I think it's really subjective uh, in terms of what, what works best is represented. I mean, there might be people in the room with, with perspectives on this. For me, it's, it's always centred around kind of rights issues and ethics, and I think showing what happens when bad decisions are made or that when good decisions aren't made is a really engaging way of engaging people. <laughs> that makes any sense, but yeah, um, I'm, yeah, I don't know. Okay, any others? So a number of years ago, Google uh, launched something called Google Sketch, mm -hmm. where it effectively crowdsourced everyone's. Um, opinions and conceptual uh, views of what things like chickens were or dogs or what have you. So as a mechanism to engage people and, and to see how that data then can be interpreted into a local machine learning algorithm and then generate mm. something. Have we ever thought about actually creating things that help people create data sets that they can see the significance of something rather than just, I suppose, uh, talking about it? Um. Well, so BBC R&D created this data box. I forget the exact name of it now, but it's quite a useful representation of a physical box that you could put personal data into um, about your preferences that would exist as this kind of vulnerable physical thing. So, you know, if it's damaged, what happens to the data? And that, I found that quite a useful way of showing how things could be physical. It's a real app. I'm, I'm, it's more of a something real that's in competition and offers right. an option, to, yeah. an alternative. Hmm. to saying that there's no alternative. Alternative to what? To all the data goes to Google, all the data goes to Facebook, all the data goes to 101 yeah. marketing agencies out in the US that nobody knows it's all going to. Hmm. Well, that, yeah, that's an example I've seen that I thought was quite engaging. If anyone else has another example, that'd be great as well. Yeah? Um, how do you rate immersive technologies? In, um, how do I rate? Immersive technologies. In general? Uh, no, in, in terms of um, providing a way of visualizing data. Um, it's not a lot out there, I think, that's um, visually appealing. Mm, yeah, I think the story aspect is often missing. And when people feel it as a more conceptual thing, it's quite hard to engage personally and emotionally. So yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't seen any that I felt kind of spellbound by myself. How about you? Um, I mean, I went to the Oceans of Air at Versace, which um, made you um, made visualize your breath, for example. Mm -hmm. that, I went into this tree, and they, the story was good. I mean, mm. the visuals, yeah, I mean, that's a personal preference, obviously. But um, I thought that was a good start. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but I think it's it's a bit underrate, uh, underrated yet, and I think there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, great. I can just respond to that. Loads of artists are working with VR increasingly, um, but obviously cost is a real barrier and access to the equipment. But there's a lot of really interesting work coming from artists who work with technology, but also from artists in the field of photography. Mm -hmm. And so even major photography festivals are having sort of VR uh, sections now, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks.
Um, I wondered if you'd had any thoughts in terms of the, the people whose opinions you've canvassed, etc., and whether you'd sort of talk to them about this trade-off between sort of convenience and what happens to their data. Because I'm wondering how many people are aware of things like, um, you know, using social sign-ins to enable passwords to be kind of passported from one data app to the other, yeah. and whether... I know someone mentioned over there that you know you get this sort of attitude from a lot of people. I just don't care. Mm. I wonder if people are actually aware of what's going on and the technology behind the scenes that's enabling that kind of thing when they adopt something for their convenience without actually kind of maybe thinking more about the consequences. Mm. I know that there are lots of interesting examples emerging for mm. how to create. Uh, a business advantage from GDPR. It's kind of relevant, but I don't know if it answers your question. I've, but I've seen lots of really interesting ways in which companies are spinning up that offer people more of a kind of, more agency, but more of a, an engaging and enjoyable process of deciding w when and how they want data about them to be shared. Um, and that kind of ties into the slightly murky world of data ownership versus rights. Um, but it's, I think it's a really interesting area that lots of people are having quite good ideas about, at least. Okay, are there any other questions in the room? Another thing to say is that I obviously spam through it quite quickly, but I will share my slides on Twitter and I've linked to all of the, the sources and the artists, so if you want to understand more about them, you can go back and look. Okay, well, thank you very much, Anna, for a very interesting talk and your thoughts of the questions and thank you all for coming and asking your questions and if you're watching online as well. Thank you. Thank you.